here as a pastor, or not in any systematic way. And I began to look at the first part, and I found, I thought, it's a, a shortened sermon here, isn't it, this morning? The first three verses really give us plenty uh, to think about. We will mention what comes later. This is, of course, a great prophecy, an astounding prophecy of the death of Christ given some 700 years before he came into the world. And it's in five stanzas of three verses, and we're looking at this first one, which in a sense is introductory, but there's a lot here. So just to, to go through, really, what, what is said. It starts, doesn't it? Behold. Look at this. Think about this. This is important. My servant shall act wisely, or maybe prudently, but it's the same thing, really. Proverbs 8 and verse 12 says, I, wisdom, dwell together with prudence. And the idea is of doing that which it, it makes sense, doing that which is right in the sense of the, the fitting thing to do. And we know that the Lord Jesus did that. Indeed, and what is the fitting thing to do? The fitting thing to do for him and for us is to serve God. That is the wise thing to do, to serve God, not to rebel against him. We read in Hebrews 10 of Jesus coming and fulfilling another prophecy. Behold, I have come to do your will, O God, as is written of me in the scroll of the book. And the Lord Jesus on earth testifying, he who, who sent me is with me, he has not left me alone, for I always do the things that are pleasing to him. Wisdom, we're told, is the fear of the Lord. That is wisdom. To shun evil is understanding, says Job. And of course that brings us, doesn't it, straight uh, to the cross here. Because he is doing what is right, he is doing what is wise, and those who opposed him and caused him to be nailed to the cross thought exactly the opposite. They, despite the way he had fulfilled so many of the Old Testament prophecies, despite the miracles, despite the teaching which came, as they said, it's with authority, they considered the Lord Jesus a blasphemer. They considered his claim to be the Son of God as blasphemy. They considered that he was a false Messiah. And so they nailed him to the cross. And the verse goes on and says, he shall be high and lifted up and shall be exalted. And, and it sounds just like normal poetic Hebrew parallelism. And yet those two phrases are taken up very differently in the New Testament. And worked out in verses 14 and 15 here. If we take the phrase, he shall be high and lifted up. Well, we know what the Lord Jesus says this meant. He tells us himself. John 8 and verse 28, the verse before the one we've quoted, Jesus said to them, when you have lifted up the Son of Man, then you will know that I am he. Again, the teaching that he gave to Nicodemus, John 3 and verse 14, as Moses lifted up the servant in the wilderness, so must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whoever believes in him may have eternal life this is clearly speaking of his being lifted up upon the cross to die as the hymn writer says lifted up was he to die but then the second phrase he shall be exalted is used in a different sense a very contrasting sense so in philippians 2 you have of the lord jesus christ that being found in high human form <laughs> He humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. Therefore, there's the obedience. There's the, the lifting up. Therefore, God has highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name that is above every name, so that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow. The exaltation to glory, the ascension of Christ as the... To, as the reward and to fulfill the purpose of his death. Acts 2, Peter preaches on the day of Pentecost. Verse 32, this Jesus God raised up, and of this we are all witnesses, being therefore exalted at the right hand of God, and having received from the Father the promise of the Holy Spirit, 
He has poured out this that you yourselves are seeing and hearing. In other words, there is much more in verse 13 here of Isaiah 52 that, than would meet the eye. It's one of these prophecies that uh, when it's fulfilled, you say, oh, that's what it meant. It meant more than we could understand. And those two aspects are taken up in the verses that follow. The death of the Saviour is spoken of here in verse 14. As many were astonished at you, his appearance was so marred beyond human semblance and his form beyond that of the children of man. We have not a lot, do we, in the scripture about the physical suffering of Christ. When you read the uh, crucifixion accounts, they, they speak of his being scourged by the Romans. Then when you get to the crucifixion, it's often just a few words, and they crucified him, or even in one gospel, having crucified him. The, the emphasis is not on the physical. It is taught, of course, in the scripture. And you have uh, Psalm 22 in particular, another extraordinary prophecy of this one who is hung up and has his hands and feet pierced. Uh, and he says it, it's like his bones are out of joint and it's like he's melting away. This is the pain that he's suffering. Uh, and we must not ignore it. He, suffered, he was scourged, he was nailed to a cross, he was, that cross piece was lifted up and dropped into the, the pole which would all remain there all the time and he was crucified and for three hours from what we would call nine o'clock to twelve o'clock in the morning he suffered and he spoke to, to, to those around him and, and then at noon the sun was darkened and for three hours Jesus hung on a cross, but invisible to human eye. And for those three hours, from 12 o'clock to 3 o'clock, that's when he is suffering the wrath of God. The Father's face turned away. And we, it's not speculation, isn't it? We're taking it from this verse to say surely it, the, the reason the sun was dark and was for different reasons but one of them was so that no human eye could actually see the son of God suffering under the wrath of his father and what was happening to him physically then we do not know but we're told here his appearance was marred beyond human semblance and his form beyond that of the children of man in other words he, he would have looked worse than other criminals being crucified we do not know what effects it had upon him what is being taught to us isn't it is to remember that this is no ordinary death this is not the death of a criminal on a cross it's not even the death of an innocent man unjustly crucified it's the death of the son forsaken by the Father, forsaken certainly in his experience and with God's wrath poured upon him. There has to be, doesn't there, an underlying supporting of the Son, but he knew nothing of this. And so we are brought, aren't we, to, the, to what is then expanded in the later verses, that he bore our griefs, verse 4, and carried our sorrows, wounded for our transgressions, crushed for our iniquities. The Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. The law is the will of the Lord, verse 10 of chapter 53, to crush him. He made his soul an offering for grief. And then he goes on to speak of yet afterwards. But this is, this is the emphasis, isn't it? The sufferings of the soul of Christ for our sins, bearing our place, in our place condemned he stood sealed our pardon with his blood suffering and in the end dying for our sin and then we come to the result and the result is here in verse 15 i want to say a little about this so shall he sprinkle many nations this is a contrast isn't it 
Here is verse 14, and the, the picture is of someone who is suffering and dying, uh, and you would say that's the end, and of course it isn't the end, and on the third day he rose from the dead. And that's not the end, is it? Wonderful though the resurrection is, it's, it, the purpose is here. Here is someone who is not, it's not just even, is it? So, though we're coming to this in a moment, that he will be heard of in many nations. It, it's he is going to sprinkle, and the picture is of the sprinkling of blood, which takes away sin. This is the first of three results of his death here, that he cleanses many by his sprinkled blood. So shall he sprinkle many nations. In John 12 and verse 32, again, the Lord Jesus Christ speaks and he says of himself, and I, when I am lifted up from the earth, will draw all people to myself. The scriptures work this out. Hebrews 9 and verse 19 speaks of under the old covenant that when every commandment of the law had been declared by Moses <coughs> to all the people, he took the blood of calves and goats with water and scarlet wool and hyssop and sprinkled both the book itself and all the people saying, this is the blood of the covenant that God commanded for you. And in the same way he sprinkled <coughs> the tent, the vessels, indeed everything, he says, without, is purified with blood, without the shedding of blood. There is no forgiveness of sins. Every, all the sacrifices, there was blood shed to typify sins forgiven. But going back to verses 13 and 14, if the blood of goats and bulls and the sprinkling of, goat, uh, uh, of defiled persons with the ashes of a heifer sanctify for the purification of the flesh, how much more will the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit offered himself without blemish to God, purify our conscience from dead works to serve the living God? The Lamb of God offering, <coughs> dying without blemish, <coughs> excuse me, and there it is, the sprinkling. Not the sprinkling of the book of the old covenant and the people under the old covenant, the sprinkling of us, of our souls, the blood applied to us. Many hymns I could have chosen this morning. You have a spot for choice, aren't you, on Good Friday? There's a whole section. And I didn't read, choose this one, but Abel's blood for vengeance pleaded to the skies, but the blood of Jesus for our pardon cries, oft as it is sprinkled on our guilty hearts, Satan in confusion, terror-struck departs. The sprinkling of her many nations. And that comes on to the second of these consequences of Jesus' death. Kings shall shut their mouths because of him. Rulers who are opposing him, silenced from their scoffing, and so that they oppose him no more. Well, you historically you could give many, many examples, couldn't you? Including in our own land, where kings were pagans and the gospel was proclaimed. And at some point they said, yes, you can preach this gospel in this land. Sometimes they would say, you can't, no one can be of any other religion except this. But the point being that if you look across the world from the one nation in which Jesus died, at some point in history, in land after land after land, <coughs> Those who are rulers and think that they are it and think that they are the top dog and they've had to say there is more than me. He is greater than me. And they have bowed the knee, some of them personally, to Christ and others at least on the level of saying this truth needs to be told to my people. And we know why. For that which has not been told them they see, and that which they have not heard they understand. And when the Apostle Paul, speaking of his preaching of the gospel, says in Romans 15 of what, why he did what he did, he says, verse 20, uh, I made it my ambition to preach the gospel not where Christ has already been named, lest I build on someone else's foundation, 
But as it is written, and then he quotes this verse, those who have never been told of him will see and those who have never heard of him will understand. There, Paul says, is my motive to go where Christ has not been named, to fulfill this prophecy, to be part of the fulfilling of this prophecy, which the Christian church has then done, not as it should have done, but has done throughout the world from that day to this. The nations hear what they didn't know, the gospel. Isaiah speaks much of the ends of the earth in his prophecy. To Isaiah, we were the ends of the earth. These islands which they would just about have heard of by Phoenician traders, perhaps. And, well, here we are. And the gospel has been in this land for centuries. And people who weren't told have been told. And didn't hear, but now understand. And that's us, by God's grace, isn't it? So to, to finish, with six, don't worry, very briefly, six applications that follow on one from another. One application, really, praise God. It's right that we should come, isn't it, this morning and be humbled again at the thought of the Saviour's suffering and death. It's right that we should be humbled at the thought that he loved us so much that he did this for us. It's right that we should have wonder and awe. But we should also praise God for our salvation. Six points, quickly. Praise God first that Jesus obeyed, that he did, as we've already read, become obedient even to death. Obeyed all the way through obeyed perfectly so that his perfect righteousness can be imputed to us as our sins are laid on him. Praise God for the faithfulness of Christ. Praise God, secondly, that he died for our sins. That is the reality, isn't it? That he has died for our sins. Well, we praise God that he has done it, that he's finished the work. Thirdly, praise God that God has exalted him, as this passage speaks of. Exalted to rule, exalted to save, exalted to rule over all things for the sake of the church, his body. Fourthly, praise God that by the grace of God, we are included in those people who have heard. Go back a few verses from where we are into verse 10 of chapter 52. The Lord has bared his holy arm before the eyes of all the nations and all the ends of the earth shall see the salvation of our God. And here, there we have. And God has in his grace brought the gospel to our land and to us personally through his providence. Many people less uh, perhaps fewer when, when we were, uh, many of us growing up, but now much more so, never hear the gospel. And there were people who brought up alongside us in churches that never preached the gospel, that denied the gospel, that hid the gospel. And God in his grace has brought it to us. And fifthly then, praise God that by God's grace we have believed. Who says at the beginning of the next chapter, says the prophet, who has believed what he has heard from us? And to whom have, has the arm of the Lord been revealed? And, and if I, as I was standing here and saying that this morning, we'd have to put our hand up and say, me! Praise God that we can do that. That we have believed what we heard, for many don't. That the arm of the Lord has been revealed and made us willing in the day of his power and brought us by grace to God and there to Christ and therefore lastly praise God that by his grace we are cleansed from our sin this morning as we come we do not have to come uh, around the Lord's table and say Lord I've got these sins and maybe that means I'm not going to get to heaven after all we come to the cleansing blood always don't we through the righteousness of Christ through his atoning death we are have boldness to approach God, Hebrews 10. And we can rejoice that we are cleansed from our sin. He has sprinkled us with his blood. Well, let's come and sing and then we'll come around the table. Now, this hymn, I don't know if you know it, uh, but I'm pretty sure that most of you will know the tune, the 